Praise be Jesus and Mary. This first weekday of Advent, as we just begin the season of preparation for Christmas, the church reminds us, asks us to meditate, to reflect upon the fact that our Lord took on human flesh. Our Lord took on a human nature, and he did so in a human family. This is not without its meaning or weight for us. It's not without its significance and importance in our reflection and meditation. The theological axiom goes that all that our Lord has assumed, he has redeemed. He assumed a human nature, he redeemed a human nature. Our Lord has assumed in a broad sense, he has assumed a human family as his own family and has redeemed the human family And you you hate to have to point out something so obvious, something so impious to say in relation to the Holy Family, but something that so invades our lives today and so so tempts, so risks to confuse us that we have to do it. The family our Lord assumed and redeemed was not Joseph and two Marys, was not Mary and two Josephs, was not Joseph and Joseph, was not Mary and Mary, but Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, one man, one woman, and their offspring. In the case of the Holy Family, a virginal offspring. And it is this family that the Lord has redeemed, the only possible family that he has made part of his plan of salvation. There's some dissent today from the way the family uh, has been created by our Lord, from the way our Lord uh, has assumed it, from the way in which he himself has lived in it. The recent synod has showed us precisely that. Even within the church, there's some confusion and dissent, we could say. Cardinal Mueller, he's the Pope's man appointed to watch over the purity of doctrine. Summing up the synod, he said, well, there are even representatives of the church, even bishops, who in some way have allowed themselves to become blinded have allowed themselves to become blinded and lose sight of this truth of faith of the family unit as being one man, one woman, and their offspring. And during the coming year, as we approach another synod on this topic, we just, uh, the church just concluded an extraordinary synod on the family, uh, an ordinary synod in October of 2015 is coming. And we can expect, we can expect the bark of Peter to go through some turbulent waters We have to brace ourselves and uh, we have to brace ourselves for the turbulence, hold on to the magisterium and be careful not to fall off the boat. And as often has happened in history here, I'm not being a prophet by no means. It's often happened, it's often happened in the history of uh, the church that the bark of Peter has been hit by waves. It's on the water, waves hit it, it's nothing new. We'll probably see some high waves hit the boat soon we might, see people, uh, we might see people on the boat fighting between each other. We might see people on the boat trying even to do damage to the bark of Peter, trying to make it sink. We might see people uh, lose, waver in their faith and jump off the boat for one reason or another. But we have to console ourselves and remember that it's been far worse in the past. And the church has survived, has not sunk. It will survive still, as will all those and only those who will stay on board. So today, benefiting from the grace of Advent, I thought it opportune as a preparation for our our Lord's Nativity to reflect on what's at the root of it all, to reflect on what's at the root of all this dissent and confusion today, and even at the expense of uh, having uh, today a, a reflection slightly longer than usual, I promise you it'll be interesting. I won't be the one doing the speaking. We'll look at a little conference given by a, excerpts from a conference given by a, an American cardinal, Cardinal Francis Stafford. He spoke in that encyclical of Blessed Pope, Pope Paul VI, Humane Vitae, issued in 1968, at the root of it all, because with the rejection of the encyclical Humane Vitae, which happened 46 years ago now, with the rejection of church teaching, on the inseparably reproductive and unitive, complementary purpose and meaning of human sexuality, we ran into the consequences which we're living today. So Cardinal Francis Stafford, I quote, 
On the 40th anniversary of Humanae Vitae, I've been asked to reflect on one event of that year, 1968, the doctrinal dissent among some priests and theologians in an American archdiocese on the occasion of its publication. This dissent, here the cardinal describes in his own diocese, it was actually happening across the board, we could say, not only in one American diocese, but in many, in many countries. Bishops and cardinals were dissenting, rebelling against the Pope, not just bishops and uh, cardinals alone, individuals, whole bishops' conferences Canada openly, formally dissented against the Pope. And we might, we might, not being a prophet, we're just trying to be realistic, we might be running into a parallel situation now with the Synod on the Family. It is useful to study, therefore, some, a bit of history on this topic. The Cardinal goes on, it is not an easy or welcome task, but since, since it may help some followers of Jesus to live what blessed Pope Paul VI called a more disciplined life, I will explore that event. The summer of 1968 is a record of God's hottest hour. The memories are not forgotten, they are painful. In 1968, something terrible happened in the church. Within the ministerial priesthood, ruptures developed everywhere among friends which never healed, and the wounds continue to affect the whole church. The dissent, together with the leader's manipulation of the anger they fomented, became a supreme test. It changed fundamental relationships within the church. Some background material is necessary, the Cardinal says. Cardinal Lawrence J. Sheehan, the sixth Archbishop of Baltimore, was my ecclesiastical superior at that time. Pope Paul VI had appointed him, along with others and additional members, to the Papal Commission for the Study of Problems of the Family, Population, and Birth Rates, first established by St. John XXIII in 1963. It was something, in a broad sense, we can compare it to the Synod today where the various commissions are appointed by either the Pope or the conferences of bishops to study the problems that the family is facing in our modern day and age. There had been discussions, the Cardinal goes on, there had been discussions and delays and unauthorized interim reports from Rome prior to 1968. Does that sound familiar? The enlarged commission was asked to make recommendations on these issues to the Pope. In preparation for its deliberations, the Cardinal sent confidential letters seeking advice in the Church of Baltimore. I received such a letter. In a confidential letter responding to his request, I shared in a general fashion my concerns. My advice to Cardinal Sheehan was very real and specific. The unitive and procreative meanings of marriage cannot be separated. Consequently, to deprive a conjugal act deliberately of its fertility is intrinsically wrong. To encourage or approve such an abuse would lead to the eclipse of fatherhood and to the disrespect of women. So to deny the inseparability of the procreative and un unitive meanings of human sexuality would be equivalent to making fornication, adultery, and homosexuality okay. And this is precisely what's being attempted today. It's all a logical, though an evil, it's all logical consequence. There's, an, uh, there's a logic to this. Sometime later, the Papal Commission sent its recommendations to the Pope. The majority of the Commission advised that the Church's teaching on contraception be changed in light of new circumstances. Cardinal Sheehan himself was part of that majority. Even before the encyclical had been signed and issued, his vote had been made public, although not in his own initiative. Cardinal Sheehan here, I don't want to paint him as the bad guy. He later on, quote unquote, repented. He wasn't the one manipulating the commission and leaking out its, uh, its studies. The commission had no teaching authority, but it did have the ability, the capability, to create a lot of confusion. And can you imagine the trial for the church? This commission instituted by the Pope all of a sudden comes out with its own report and says, the teaching on contraception will change. The Pope just has to confirm it. It's a matter of time. Can you imagine the malice of those involved in the confusion for Catholics. The Cardinal goes on, as we know, the Pope decided otherwise, and he couldn't do otherwise. In an infallible decision in encyclical Humanae Vitae, he repeated that contraception is intrinsically wrong, it's a sin, and it ruins marriages, it's never listed for Catholic couples to use. This teaching of the Pope sets the scene for the tragic drama following the actual date of the publication of the encyclical letter on July 29, 1968. Summarizing, one, the Pope institutes a commission. It's supposed to help him to, uh, to, in a more reasonable, more credible way, 
expound the Catholic teaching on the sinfulness of contraception. The commission makes evident the direction it wants to take to change teaching on contraception. Three, the commission leaks out information, manipulates people to think church teaching is about to change and that the Pope will approve of it. Four, finally, at the end of it all, the Pope rejects the suggestions of the commission, reaffirms Catholic teaching. Five, dissent breaks out, open dissent breaks out. In his memoirs, Cardinal Sheehan describes the immediate reaction of some priests in Washington to the encyclical. After receiving the first news of the publication of the encyclical, the Reverend Charles E. Curran, instructor of moral theology at the Catholic University of America, flew back to Washington from the West where he had been staying. Late on the afternoon of July 29th, he and nine other professors of theology of the Catholic University met by evident prearrangement in Caldwell Hall to receive again by prearrangement with the Washington Post encyclical, part by part, as it came from the press. The story further indicated that by 9 o'clock that night, they had received the whole encyclical, read it, analyzed it, criticized it, and had composed their 600-word statement of dissent. Then they began that long series of telephone calls to theologians throughout the East, which went on, according to the Post, until 3.30 a.m., the devil never sleeps, seeking authorization to attach their names as endorsers. Meanwhile, they had arranged through one of the local television stations to have their statement broadcast that very night. The test began. A few days after the encyclical's issuance, I received an invitation by telephone from a, from a recently ordained assistant pastor to attend a gathering of some Baltimore priests to discuss the encyclical, I thought. I agreed to come. Eventually, a large number of priests were gathered in a rectory's basement. I knew them all. These were uh, priest friends of his from the Diocese of Baltimore. My expectations of the meeting proved unrealistic. I had hoped that we had been called together to receive copies of the encyclical and to discuss it. I was mistaken. I was mistaken because neither happened. After welcoming us and introducing the leadership, the pastor came to the point. He expected each of us subscribe to the Washington Statement of Dissent. Before our arrival, the conveners had decided that the Baltimore priest's rejection of the, papal, of the papal encyclical would be published the following morning in the Baltimore Sun, one of the daily newspapers. The Washington Statement was read aloud, then the leader asked each of us to agree to have our names attached to it. No time was allowed for discussion, reflection, or prayer. Each priest was required individually to give a verbal yes or no. I could not sign it. Noting that my seat was last in the packed basement, I listened to each priest's response, hoping for support. It didn't materialize. Everyone agreed to sign. There were no abstentions, and as the last called upon, I felt isolated. The basement became suffocating. The room was charged with tension. Something epical was taking place. It became clear that the leader's strategy had been carefully mapped out beforehand. It was moving along without a hitch. Their rhetorical skills were having their anticipated effect. They had planned carefully how to exert what amounted to emotional and intellectual coercion. Violence by overt manipulation was new to the Baltimore Presbyterate. The leader's reaction to my refusal was predictable and awful. The whole process now became a grueling struggle, a terrible test. He tried to force me to change. He became visibly angry and verbally abusive. The underlying fraternal violence became more and more evident. That back then, the word fraternity, priestly fraternity, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't divide the presbyterates, don't hurt, don't wound priestly fraternity by your dissenting opinions was, was all the rage. Now we'd say collegiality, don't break, don't infringe, don't, uh, you know, don't uh, put a wedge in, uh, in church collegiality today. We'd say collegial violence today. He questioned this leader. He questioned and then derided my, my integrity. He taunted me to risk my ecclesiastical future and the abuse went on. With surprising coherence, however, I was eventually able to respond that the Pope's encyclical deserved the courtesy of a reading, at least. None of us had read it. All of this was happening before the encyclical even came out to the public general knowledge. The encyclical had not yet come out, and yet there was already a storm raging against it. 
Everything was planned out ahead of time. I continued by saying that as a matter of fact, I agreed with and, accept, I agreed with and accepted the Pope's teaching as it had been reported in the public media. That response elicited even more ridicule. Otherwise, there was silence. Finally, seeing that I would remain firm, the ex-Marine priest moved on to complete the business and to adjourn the meeting, and the leaders then prepared a statement for the next morning's daily paper. The meeting in this way ended. I sped out of there free, but disorientated. We all had been subjected to a new thing in the church, something unexpected. A pastor and several seminary professors had abused rhetoric to undermine the truth within the evangelical community. This was going on at, a high, at higher levels all around the world as well. When opposed, they assumed the role of Job's friends. Their contempt became a nightmare. The violence of the priest's August gathering gave rise to its own ferocious acrimony. Conversations among the clergy, where they still existed, became contaminated with fear. Suspicions among priests were chronic, fears abounded, and they continue. Something else happened among priests on that violent August night. Friendship in the church sustained a direct hit. Jesus, by calling those who were with him his friends, had made friendship a privileged analogy of the church. That analogy became obscured after a large number of priests expressed shame over their leaders and repudiated their teaching. But that night was not a total loss. The test was unexpected and unwelcome. Its unhinging consequences continue. Abusive, coercive dissent has become a reality in the church and subjects her to violent, debilitating, unproductive, chronic controversies. But I did discover something new. Others also did. When the moment of Christian witness came, no Christian could be coerced who refused to be. Despite the novelty of being treated as an object of shame and ridicule, I did not become ashamed of the gospel. It was not a bad lesson. Ecclesial, ecclesial obedience ran the test. The violence of the initial disobedience was only a prelude to further and more pervasive violence. Priests wept at meetings over the manipulation of their brothers. Contempt for the truth, whether aggressive or passive, has become common in church life. Dissenting priests, theologians, and lay people have continued. Excuse me here. have continued their course of techniques from the beginning of the press. From the beginning, the press has used them to further its own serpentine agenda. Diocesan presbyterates have not recovered from that July and August night, nights in 1968. Many in consecrated life have also failed the evangelical test. Since then, the abyss has opened up elsewhere. The whole people of God, including children and adolescents, just look at the sexual education programs that kids are studying in Catholic schools today and you'll understand what these words mean. The whole people of God, including children and adolescents, now must look into the abyss and see what dread beasts are at its bottom. Each of us shudders before the wrath of God, each weeps in sorrow for our sins, and each begs for the Father's merciful remembrance of Christ's obedience. Francis Cardinal Stafford, major penitentiary of the Apostolic Penitentiary. So there's still some of this dissent in the church today, but we have to remember the Cardinal's words. When the moment of Christian witness comes, no one can be forced to dissent unless he does so by his own free choosing. Ecclesial obedience will always run the distance. There has always been dissent, only at the end of time will our Lord separate the weeds from the good grain. There might be more dissent coming, but in the very end, we know, we can be sure of this with the surety, with the certainty of faith, that the sin of fornication will remain the sin of fornication. The sin of adultery will remain the sin of adultery. The sin of impurity against nature will remain exactly that, a sin of impurity against nature. We'll still have to love the sinner, but hate the sin. So may the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, intercede for us and for the whole church, especially for the Holy Father. In the coming time of Advent, and beyond. We have to brace ourselves for the turbulence that might come and hold on to the magisterium in order not to fall off the boat, consoling ourselves by remembering that it's been bad in the past, far worse in the past, even in the recent past. 
The church has survived, it will survive still, as will all those and only those who stay on board. Praised be Jesus. And be